better. All right. Well, today we want to continue our study, and, and uh, I've been working the last um, couple weeks to try to get this PowerPoint kind of finished like I want. I pretty much have it like I want. Uh, still going to try to add and keep studying some things on it. But just to let you know, in case you're wondering, we are over halfway through the material I had planned to share with you. At any point, y'all say, I want to stop and do something else, y'all let me know. But uh, I think within the next month and a half or two months, we should be finished this with this and be ready to move on to something else. And y'all can be thinking about the next thing that we want to study. Um, and I'm, I'm up for whatever, whether it be a, a, another topical thing that y'all are interested in or a particular section. Um, as far as PowerPoints that I have done, I've gotten everything from um, Genesis through Song of Solomon. I've got on PowerPoint everything from Matthew through Galatians and the book of Revelation I have on PowerPoint. And if there's some of that that you're interested in, let me know. I know uh, that has been in Acts. And one, one of my goals is to finish putting the entire Bible on PowerPoint. I want to do that at some point in time. Um, so if I, I was thinking in my mind about going back and getting Isaiah, which is something I haven't done yet that I would like to do at some point in time. We don't have to do that. Uh, again, we've got time to figure that out, but just want to put that bug in your ear and y'all be thinking about the next thing y'all would like to study when we finish this. And again, I'm, I'm up for whatever uh, y'all are interested in looking at. Years ago, Keith, we went through a series of studies. I don't remember who taught it, but it was on the different religions, what different religions believed. You remember who taught that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. A little, we had a book. Uh, yeah. We had, had a book. A book uh, yeah. I've got one at home. But, uh, um, cults and... Yeah, you know, it, it'd be... It would be informative to know a little bit more about different religions, especially like Jehovah's Witnesses and things, because they come around to your house. You know, right, it? right. And... Uh, and to be able to discuss things like that. I don't know if you'd be interested, if that'd be enough to to make a series or not. But, okay. Uh, what we had to do, we, uh, we used both traditions of man versus the Word of God. I think right, I think right. That comes to time. I, I remember teaching it, but it had. Was, did you teach it? Yeah. It had, it had everything from, you know, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian scientists, Adventists, Baptists, all that. Presbyterians. The whole bit. Yeah. I remember it was an interesting study. I think that's Muslims. I think Muslims. I think Muslims have been there. But I can't remember. It might, might have been. Church. But there a lot of them. They have kind of, kind of item by item where we say what the denomination world believes, what the Bible says, and kind of side by side kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's the one I remember. I know we, we did that in school. It was a really good study. Okay. And uh, like, Boy was just saying that they come around and be kind of nice to be able to uh, refute some of the their exactly okay uh, no exact uh, real quick what, which which verses to go to that it would right right but you hope you just know short and somewhat short study you wouldn't have to be a long right long right long right long. yeah yeah, yeah well, just a thought but <laughs> when I was in uh, college my freshman year uh, we had like sweets. You know, where we stayed, and there would be there would be like I don't know, probably eight or ten, you know, guys. It was you know men's and women's dorms, and so uh, there was a Muslim guy that was you know, in my suite, and just nicest, just nicer guys you probably meet. And so we got into a lot of discussions. I mean, I wasn't, I had didn't decide to be a Christian at that point. I was still you know, just kind of seeking and so. Right. And just open-minded you know, to different ideas and opinions, but you know, I talked to him quite a bit, and uh, and from what I gathered, there's basically kind of two trains of thought in, in the Muslim world. You got the extreme side of it, and then you got what. But it's it's just good to kind of see, because you know, you hear a lot of things about, and you can kind of let those things form your opinion on how they are. You kind of group everybody into one basket. Sometimes. Right, right. And then, uh, you know, that way, your approach, like, like, like Scott is saying, is you, you kind of know how to, you have, you can come into it a little bit educated to where, you know, when you're having a discussion with them, you can keep it, you know, keep it heartfelt based on kind of some, maybe some reality in, in, instead of necessarily just you know, public or controversial opinion. Right. So, 
The mountains don't believe Christ was a prophet. Don't they? they do. And I read, uh, I read the Koran uh, a year or two after 9-11 because I, I was curious to see well, what would motivate somebody to do that. So I actually read it. I've got a copy. So if something ever happens to me and I kick the bucket, and y'all, there's a copy of the Koran in my library. That just, I was curious about that. But yes, uh, they do believe um, he was a prophet. And it's, it's interesting when you read it, um, they talk about Adam and Eve and talk about Noah and Abraham and, um, and some things that I found that you could use in studying with them because in the Koran, they call the Old Testament, they acknowledge that it's inspired and they acknowledge the New Testament is inspired, which surprised me. They say that what we have now is that been corrupted. Oh. So that's, that's their idea. But the originals that was inspired, Muhammad came to correct the the problems and this sort of thing. So you can read the Quran and straighten out what we missed in Christianity. I had a book of Mormon at one time, but I don't know where it is. Well, I've read the Book of Mormon also. So don't look at me sideways on that, but I have read that as well. <laughs> I thought it was written ridiculously. Some of it looked like an eight year old child wrote it. I told my I, I gave my dad that, that copy. I don't know if you did you have a chance to read it? I read some of it. I read some of it. it to me I thought it was the most boring book I've ever read. Yeah. Yeah, because there was a lot of this stuff that I couldn't follow in it. Was, that was my first impression. Not trying to be rude, but that's how it came across to me. Very hard to follow some of it. Uh, Charlie? Well, one thing that book that I gave you and I, one I was reading great comfort said, beware of the Mormons, the Muslims, and the Hindus because to him they're known as a cult. Yeah. Well, that's false, uh, people. Well, and I think any time you follow uh, a man, I think that kind of fits in the definition of a cult. And uh, and those you're right. You know, they have followed a man and followed the teachings of a man and supplanted the word of God with the philosophies of men. But good point. One day we can be saved by it. It's not Mohammed. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right. All right. Well, that, that's proof of thought. That, that is something we could uh, we can look at. Whether I teach that or. Dad, if you want to teach that, but uh, but that's something we can definitely look at. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. All right. Last time we were talking about um, the, uh, the the speed of light and this sort of thing, and uh, Brother Wayne has done more reading and studying on that subject than I have. But he was talking before class about, and he's right that uh, there's a lot of evidence seem to say that it can change and the various things with that. And um, I closed with uh, this the other day. And as I was telling uh, Brother Wayne this morning, I haven't, I watched some stuff on him a couple years ago that was really interesting. Some of it's fuzzy in my head right now. A guy named Russell Humphreys, you can't see his name right here, but Russell Humphreys um, is a creationist, a young earth creationist. That, and this presentation is on how time might have been a lot faster at the beginning. Very interesting, very over my head, but uh, if some of y'all are interested in looking at that more, there's a bunch of stuff on YouTube from him, Russell Humphreys, that is really uh, good material. So, and we were kind of looking at this um, last time. Does light travel at a constant rate? People don't know. What were the initial conditions? That, that is a question in all of the dating things that evolutionists try to do. You don't know what the initial conditions were. The idea, at, whether it be, and we'll look at this in, in another uh, later on in this uh, discussion, like uh, how fast uranium turns into lead. Well, the rock, how much, uh, how much uranium was there at the beginning? We don't know. Was it all uranium at the start, or was it not? We don't know that. And so there's a lot of initial conditions you don't know in any of these things. You don't know what those were. A uh, quote from Spike Pissaris, uh, he is a creationist who used to be an evolutionist who studied this and said, this can't be right. He is fascinating. If you want to look at some more stuff on YouTube, very, I highly recommend uh, his material. Very interesting. He said, there's no evidence for stars being billions of years old. It is all a matter of interpretation based on the assumptions 
that are made. And I agree. A guy named John Eddy, I think I mentioned this to y'all last time, just like we did this slide last time, believes the sun is 4.5 billion years old, but said we can live with Bishop Usher's value for the age of the earth and the sun. I don't think we have much in the way of observational evidence in astronomy to conflict with that. So I appreciate his honesty. He said, I believe the solar system Earth is 4.5 billion years old, but I really can't argue with somebody that says it's 6,000, which I, I thought was a very interesting um, admission on his part. I think we uh, looked at these with you last time, talking about the, uh, again, evolutionists say we don't have an answer for how stars form. We talk about the, the galaxies, this sort of thing, and that's one of the secrets that is not shared with young people. They have no idea how stars form. None of their theories fit. And I won't read all those quotes to you again, but uh, that's interesting to me. Uh, I think this might be new. In 2003, it was estimated there are enough stars for every individual on the earth to own 11 trillion stars. We mentioned you actually, I'm told that you can have a star named after you if you wanted to. There's so many out there. If I don't know who you'd contact to do that. But if you wanted a star named after yourself, you could. And apparently you can have 11 trillion named after every person on the planet. There's that many of them. Well, I, do that. <laughs> I, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Textbooks say, and, and show you how um, some of the, the information they give in textbook is false. Uh, I thought that uh, this was uh, something that caught my eye a while back. Textbooks say that it takes billions of years for a star to evolve from a red giant to a white dwarf. So that's what happens with stars. It goes from a red giant, kind of burns itself out, it goes to a white dwarf. Egyptian hieroglyphics from 2000 BC describe Sirius as a red star. In 50 BC, Cicero, who is, uh, who is considered to be one of the greatest Roman orators and writers of the century before Christ was born, uh, he was actually elected to consul at one time, like the co-president of Rome, and uh, he was killed after, after in 43 B.C. after the assassination of Julius Caesar. Uh, Mark Antony was not a fan of Cicero and had him put to death. But anyway, uh, Cicero stated that it was red. So here was a Roman writer that says Cicero, uh, Sirius was a red star. Uh, Seneca describes uh, Sirius as redder than Mars. Uh, Ptolemy in AD 150 identified Sirius as one of six red stars. Today, Sirius is recognized as a white star binary. Textbooks say it should take billions of years for this to happen, but the textbooks are wrong. So here's something that writers at the time of Christ said Sirius was a red star, it's a white star now. So what's the point of that? It doesn't take billions of years for that to happen. It doesn't take billions of years for that to happen. A supernova is formed every 30 years, according to a scientific publication from 1998. The star dies and explodes into a supernova. Scientists estimate that there are less than 300 supernovas. If the universe, apologize for the spelling there, is billions of years old, shouldn't there be hundreds of millions of them? Also, where's the evidence for the birth of stars? So, they talk about uh, these supernovas that are formed. There's less than 300 of them in history. Should be a whole bunch more if their timetable is right. You don't find that. Determining ages of stars. The way scientists measure stars is also determined in this way. Uh, here's from Discover Magazine. Uh, we can also find absolute ages by comparing a star's color and brightness with those in stellar evolutionary models. They were saying we can measure the age of a star by how old we think it is. <laughs> I have no idea how old it is, but they just assign a date to it arbitrarily. 17 times the Bible says that God stretched out the heavens. Isaiah 40, 22 is one of those. So 17 times you'll see the phrase, God stretched out the heavens. So what did that look like? I don't know. He stretched it out. So did he create them and then he stretched them to where they are? I don't know. That's a mind-blowing concept to me. The question is not as one writer put it, how did the light get from there to here, but rather, how did the star get to where it is? And I thought that was an interesting thing. Russell Humphrey, as I talked about a minute ago, believes time moves much faster at the beginning, especially if the Earth is near the center of the universe. And like I said, a lot of the stuff that he said was over my head. Another thing that is not known, people don't even know where the Earth is in the universe. The universe is so big, they don't know where it is. Is it toward the center? 
Is it toward the edge? They don't know. And the point that Russell Humphreys made, if the Earth is near the center of the universe, time would look like it was much older, further away, if that was the case. And again, I'm not intelligent enough to show you why that's the case, why he believed that, but as I say, if that's something that, that you were, were to look at more into, he's got some real good information on YouTube. Another problem for scientists is missing intercluster medium, or what they call ICM, in star formations. These have anywhere from 10% to as little as 1% of material that should be there. Whereas if the Big Bang occurred, it doesn't have nearly as much material for each of these stars as it should. Where did all the material go? Scientists don't know. So this cuts age estimates down from billions of years down to a maximum time limit of a few million years. And again, not saying a few million is right, but I'm saying that puts a max on how old uh, those could be. Red shifts. Some of y'all could probably enlighten us more about this, but again, I'll just share a couple things with you on this. What they call the Doppler effect stretches or squeezes sound waves when either it is moving away from you or coming toward you. And Brother Wayne was talking about that effect with light uh, as well, which way you go. The same thing with sound. So there's a, a squeezing or stretching of the sound waves depending on which way things are moving. We're told that a red shift indicates that stars are moving away from you, while a blue shift indicates that stars are moving toward you. However, you cannot determine distance by using redshift. And there are examples of stars in the same galaxy that have different redshifts. And I meant, uh, I meant to put a couple of pictures in here, and I forgot to do that. But uh, what they're saying is a redshift, you can't determine that because things that should have the, red, the same redshift in the same areas of the uh, galaxy or universe do not. It should, but it doesn't. Then you have what is called trans-Neptunian objects. That's a fancy sounding word for objects uh, further away than Neptune, for the sky. Redshift, is that <clears throat> an actual color? But, and again, I meant to, looking at that, I, I meant to put a diagram in here and I didn't do that. But, uh, I've seen a couple of diagrams where they show like um, the lights from like a prism, like a rainbow forms. You have the different colors that are formed. And in looking at some of these stars, like if you look at the spectrum like it is, and again, I'm not intelligent enough to talk, but I hope you all understand what I mean, the different colors, like where the red is in that spectrum, when you look at it in space, it's shifted over one way or another is what they mean by that. And so uh, they have interpreted that as the light moving away from us, which that may be true, but the point that, that uh, some of the scientists are saying, they're confused about why stars in the same galaxy have different redshifts. It shouldn't if you follow what I'm saying. If it's in the same area, mm -hmm. this redshift should be the same, right. and that's not the case when you compare these. So that is kind of a mystery that the scientists can't explain either. And again, that's a little over my pay grade and my understanding too, but anyway, that, that's kind of what they mean by that. You and me both. <laughs> All right. Trans-Neptunian ob objects. Uh, this was off the internet. What they call TNOs is any minor planet in the solar system that orbits the sun, so it's in the solar system, at a greater average distance than Neptune, which has a semi-major axis of 30.1 astronomical units. <clears throat> if I say again, what's an astronomical unit? The way I understand it is the distance from Earth to the sun is one astronomical unit. So it's putting in perspective of how much further from us it is. So there's something beyond Neptune's uh, revolution. Typically, TNOs are further divided into the classical and resonant objects of the Kuiper belt, the scattered disk and detached objects. As of October 2020, the catalog of minor planets contains 678 numbered and more than 9,000 unnumbered TNOs. This is one of the reasons I'm told why they have de demoted Pluto. It still kind of aggravates me. I was taught in school that Pluto was a night planet. Now they're trying to demote Pluto, which that's kind of hard for me to, to change my thinking. But so anyway, Pluto seems to be one of a bunch of these types of things in this particular uh, part of the uh, universe, our, our solar system. The first trans-Neptunian object to be discovered was Pluto in 1930. It took until 1992 to discover a second trans-Neptunian object orbiting the sun directly. And again, there's so many of these things, it has it numbered, 15760 Albion. The most massive TNO known as Eris 
followed by Pluto and others. More than 80 satellites have been discovered in orbit of trans-Neptunian objects. These TNOs have fresh ice on them that apparently have come from lava. That should not be the case. Uh, they should be frozen solid. And again, this has caused more problem for evolutionists. Why do these things appear to be young and active if the uh, universe is billions of years old? They should have frozen solid by now over billions of years, and they have not. Now, it brings us to the idea of comets, which uh, is another thing that is in our favor uh, in, in thinking of the terms of the dating of the universe and this sort of thing. There's apparently two types. Uh, Long-period comets, uh, comets take more than 200 years to orbit the sun. What they call short-period comets take less than 200 years to orbit. Like the most famous one is Halley's Comet, for instance. Uh, that uh, I heard my great granddaddy talk about the one in 1910. And in 1986, I remember when I was in elementary school, some of elementary teachers saying that, hey, in 1986, y'all going to see Halley's Comet. You know, I was kind of excited about that. Hey, I'm going to get to see Halley's Comet. And uh, so this was my senior year in high school, the spring of 86, and never saw it, never saw it, never saw it, kept looking for it. And so uh, one night, me and a friend, and uh, my mom would come, my mom came, and one of my little Jill uh, came with us too. So we drove down to the beach. So we're going, we want to see Haley's Comet before it leaves. And so we, we went to the beach at like 3 in the morning and looked up at the skies and never did see it. And so I was kind of a, a bummer. I've been for, for 10 years, been looking forward to seeing Hades Comet, and I didn't. And uh, I looked a while back and, uh, about that, and they said 1986 was the, the worst time to view Hades Comet in 2,000 years. I said, boy, that, my luck. That was the, the thing that Hades Comet. But it is coming around again in 2061. So I'll be 93 years old, and I'm uh, supposed to be able to see it better. Probably my luck, I won't be able to see it. I'll be blind or something. I won't be able to see it then. But, so anyway, uh, so Haley's Comet is one of these, uh, these things. Well, you're not going to get it at 107 days. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, short period comets are losing material each time it approaches the sun and have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years because they begin to crumble. Now, there's, there's some evolutionists that will, will try to expand that a little bit, but that's, that's kind of how long they expect these comets to last, about 10,000 years. So the question is, as you're probably wondering, if short-period comets have a life of 10,000 years, why are there still short-period comets? If the Earth is 6,000 years old, shouldn't they all be gone by now? The answer is yes. Now, do you have an explanation for that? We'll share with you in just a minute. So if the Earth is billions of years old, why do we still observe comets move around the sun? Why are there so many of these short period comets? And again, this is further proof of a young universe. The fact we still see comets and we shouldn't, how do you explain that? Charlie. Well, I'm working with two guys, they were brothers, and one night we were taking a break. And now uh, we done saw a full moon who's kind of a mess color. And they told me, they said, you see the moon? And I said, what about it? It uh, made me, by seeing the uh, moon, bloody moon was a sign of something we could fix to take place. Yeah, I've heard people say that too, Charlie. And you know, from time to time, you do see that, and it's uh, kind of eerie. I, I guess, particularly, I think of some Octobers I've seen where you see a real orange moon uh, rise and this sort of thing. But yeah, I've heard people say that that too, Charlie. Good point. So here is their answer. Here's their answer. So why are we still seeing these short period comments going around? They should be gone uh, after ten thousand years. The Oort cloud is an argument used by evolutionists. So the idea is there is something called an Oort cloud beyond the solar system that every once in a while spits one of these comets out. So that's our answer. Every once in a while they spit a comet out. Once you, this is something I found on the internet and I was impressed I didn't admit this. So what is the Oort cloud? This is a theoretical formation. Now what do they mean by theoretical? Not proven. Not proven. There's something not proven. Come in, Dallas. There's something that's not proven. It has not been seen. It has not been observed. There is zero evidence for Oort. Uh, it's named after a guy named Oort, and even Oort never saw the Oort cloud. So here's uh, an Oort cloud, and that's their answer. Every once in a while, again, there's no proof of this, 
But that's the answer they got. There must be one out there because we still see these things. So inst again, instead of reevaluating their formula, they just add more and more stuff to it, and they do this all the time. Do, do planets or asteroids or whatever ever leave one universe and go into another? Could an asteroid leave one universe, uh, one area and go to another? Um, that's a good question, brother. I'm not sure. Uh, well, would that be an example? Uh, what you were just talking about? Possibly could, possibly could, but I think um, a comet is not necessarily an asteroid if I understand it right. It's kind of made up of different particles and this sort of thing than a, a regular asteroid. But I think even in the case of an asteroid, if you had an asteroid that was going that close to the sun, I think it too would be hurt by the, the process going on, as I understand it. I may not understand it, but yes. What is... Their understanding of why we've never been hit by any kind of an object. Um, I mean, me personally, I, I think it's God's love for us that He yeah. protects us, and that's just one of many, many ways that He protects us. Yeah. But what is their theory on why we hadn't had all these? In, in, in all these billions and billions of years that's gone by, we've never even, well, we did have one or two that um, made the craters, but um, uh, nothing that uh, completely and totally wiped out the Earth. Well, that's a great point. Uh, to your point, some scientists say that. They say, well, what happened to the, the uh, dinosaurs? So some of them have a belief that a big asteroid hit us 65 million years ago, and that's what happened to the, the dinosaurs. So there's been uh, some talk of that. That's one of the theories, we'll get this a bit later on, one of the theories where the moon came from. Uh, they feel like, uh, and again, I'm going to show you how ridiculous some of that is later on too, but they'll say that maybe some big comet hit the earth and a piece of it broke off, and there's our moon. That's where it came from. So they do talk about that some. And like you said, there are some craters that we have. Um, just a, a, a simple explanation. A lot of times the, our atmosphere and all that will burn stuff up as it comes in, and that's what happens to some of it. But, um, and there's still some scientists say that you know, there's going to be a doomsday at some point. We're going to be hit by a comet or asteroid. So, so, so we're just... We're just um, it's just happenstance that we're just even here. Yes. I remember I heard uh, Burke Thompson uh, give a speech. It might have been when I was in college. I can't remember. But uh, he gave a speech, and he was talking about uh, all the things, the design of our solar system, and just how perfectly it all works. And all the, it was a great presentation. You know, the Earth is rotating at a thousand miles per hour at its, it, on its axis. Uh, we're traveling 67,000 miles per hour around the sun. And then the sun is supposedly moving a uh, thousand miles per hour. And all this perfectly, nothing's running each other. And he's, he, uh, some information he gave us, he then said where he got this from, and the title of the article was Earth's Lucky Break. So went to all that and said, just, boy, aren't we lucky? Just hung it out there on, yeah. uh, on what now? On nothing. On nothing. Joke 26 of it. Yeah. By the way. Uh, you make a point a minute ago about uh, some of the theories are that some of the earth broke off and made moon upon the moon. What would make the moon round? Because you have these asteroids, big asteroids, and they're not round. Yes. And they're really round. So yeah. why did that chunk of Earth become around, 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 around. That's a great point. I don't know. It's not logical. Yeah, it just it's not logical. Off with enough, enough momentum to get to there, but still getting caught in a perfect orbit. Yep. And become yep. Yeah, yeah, and then there's another theory I saw a while back is what they call the capture theory, that there was something there was something that was going around the Earth, like this body, and it got caught in Earth's gravitational pull, and it got pulled around. Uh, and I was looking at a diagram of that. 
So that even if something like that got pulled into Earth's gravity, it would not stay in Earth's gravity. In other words, it would have deflected it. It would have just changed its routes rather than being captured around it. But well, that's another theory. Yeah, I don't understand theory. that theory either because we even use other planets and large asteroids to do that with yes. to increase our momentum to sling our stuff yep. out into space. Yep. But it, the moon's... As far as I know, it's staying a constant distance from the Earth. Yeah, for the most part. It, uh, they say that it gets about a, an inch and a half further every year. But, see, it gets an inch and a half further every year, but everything we send into space is getting closer to us because it's all falling back towards us. Yeah. So that doesn't make... You think if it got caught perfectly, it would it'd be doing like the space station is yep. constantly falling back towards us. Yep. So like that, that we're going to look at that inch and a half thing later on, but that sets a limit to how old the moon could be too, because you can measure how much is drifting away. Again, 6,000 years is not a big deal. I mean, 6,000 years, if something's drifted 9,000 inches, you know, that's, that's not, a, not a big deal. If something over billions of years, that's going to be a big deal. Because for billions of years, that means it would have been touching the Earth at some point in time. So yes. that causes them issues too. The circumference of the, or the diameter of the moon. Boy, y'all ask them some tough questions today. Uh, <laughs> is it 9,000 inches? It's not 9,000 inches, no. <laughs> it's, I believe it's about a sixth of the Earth's volume is the number off the top of my head. Right. But it's, um, matter of fact, it's one four hundredth the uh, circumference of the sun, which is another, another interesting fact is, like, we're, we're familiar with eclipses and things like that. So from time to time, you'll see an eclipse of, of the sun and this sort of thing. So the... The observational size in the sky, the sun and the moon are the same size in the sky as far as how it looks to our eye. And yet, the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. How did that happen? Because the distance of the moon is 1 400th the distance from, that it is from the earth as is the sun. And I've heard probability studies that. What's the probability of that happening by chance? None. I'm nil. That just by just by chance, it happened to be that way. Phenomenal, phenomenal to me. Yes, Chuck. I seen a falling star once, but I never could find where the Milky Way was. Well, that's a good one too, Charlie. I don't know. Uh, I've seen some pictures of the Milky Way, and we're supposed to be in it. And I'll take the word for it that we're in it, but. Uh, I, I like eating the Milky Way candy bars. Those are pretty good. Let's go. Is the moon closer to the sun at at certain points than what we are? Uh, depending on where it is in its uh, revolution, yes, it could it could be. Well, I think the distance is two hundred thirty eight thousand miles. So, it, why doesn't it warm up? Well, that's a good point. Like they say that our orbit varies a little bit too. Again, a, a, a trivia fact, during our winter time, we're actually closer to the sun than during our summertime. Mm -hmm. So during the winter, winter time, we're about 91 million. Summertime, time we're 94 million. And then it's hotter in the summer. Go ahead, Lloyd. Put some wisdom. Well, you say the moon was right. The sun was here, uh -huh. and, and the moon was going around the earth here. It was stayed the same distance away from the sun rather than like this. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a, there's a big crater out in New Mexico where a meteorite hit one time. Uh, for years and years, they thought it was a, a, a volcano, a major volcano and finally decided it was a meteorite hit it. And in the uh, museum there, they had to had a piece of meteorite, probably about this big around, something like that. It was real heavy metal. But they said it, they said it was much, much bigger than that, but it burned up as it was coming in. Right. So do all astronauts, do, do most astronauts, I mean, uh, asteroids that come near the Earth burn up before they get to the Earth? Or I, by the Earth or? I think most of them that would get into our uh, atmosphere would burn up, or at least, like, like I've heard people say that, we have dust coming from space that falls we don't see and stuff like that. You know, but, but yeah, I think for the most part, most of it would burn up 
uh, in the atmosphere, which brings another point. Like you're talking about, there are huge craters in various parts of the, the earth. Why didn't those burn up? And again, it's just my own theory. I couldn't prove this. I believe those were formed around the time of the flood. It, again, I can't prove that, but I think some of that, if you had that water that was gushing out so fast and with so much force, I think we had a lot of material that was blown up way into the, the air and eventually came back and, and hit on the earth. That's just my, my thinking. I could be wrong with that, but I think that's where some of that came from. An opinion. An opinion. All right. So the Oort cloud is an argument made by evolutionists. This is a theoretical formation thought to be 50,000 astronomical units from us. One astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Again, to show you that we're thinking about Pluto being 30 astronomical units, this Oort cloud is 50,000. So this is way, way beyond Pluto in those areas. So Pluto is 30 astronomical units from the Sun and can be only seen through a very powerful microscope. 400 billion comets are needed for this theory to have any validity, but only a maximum of 6 billion are available for which we're supposed to have what we do today. So again, what they're saying is the Oort cloud theory doesn't work, is what that's saying. The Kuiper belt is another piece of the evolutionary puzzle, which is also said to lie outside of Pluto's orbit. Evolutionists need both to exist for various reasons, but both have problems. Then the Oort cloud has not been proven. No one has ever seen it. It is based on mathematical errors, as Carl Sagan admits, a leading evolutionist admits there's errors in our thinking on the Oort cloud. He agreed that there is not a shred of evidence for it. Also, Kuiper Belt objects are too big and too few to solve the comet problems. Uh, there is no proven source for the existence of short period comets if they were truly old. If it's 6,000 years, as we believe, it's fine. You get into billions of years, they have some problems with this theory. Well, Coach, this is just another example that once you tell a lie, the only way to back up a lie is to keep lying. Yes. Because the only way they're backing up a non-proven theory is to just by throwing out their non-proven mm -hmm. theories and make them so far out there that no one can prove them wrong. And they get deeper and deeper. It's like, I, I, I can't remember if I said this last time to y'all or not, but they say that I, the observable universe, everything we see, makes up 4% of the universe. Anything that we can observe makes up 4%, according to the Big Bang Theory. So according to their theory, for their theory to work, there has to be 96% of the universe, dark matter and dark energy, which is never seen, never proven, but it must be there because the Big Bang happened. That's their, their thinking on that. It is amazing. There, there's another, like they talk about this dot, uh, this dot of material that was in existence. Now they're saying it's always been here. This dot uh, that began to inflate and explode. So they now have a theory called inflation. But in the, where that takes you is, they say that's what happened with the Big Bang. This little dot of material began inflating and then exploding. Then exploded and here's, here we all are. But the problem with that is what they've now figured out if inflation, if inflation ever started, it would have never stopped. And so now they're now saying that there's not a universe, they now believe in the multiverse. And that's an infinite number of universes that we can't see, and there's no way to prove it. Because we, we can't get across, so there's no way to prove it. But there's a multiverse, and they've gone so far to say that whatever situation you're in, like us having this conversation right now, in another multiverse, there's a group identical to us that's having the same conversation somewhere in parallel, yeah. parallel universe. Yeah. It's bizarre. But it's, to your point, once you, once you get off into error, there's no stopping it. And you got to make up more and more stuff to make your theory work. I get it. There's some inventive people. I get them that. They are. Very creative. But I've always wondered, Keith, that if you... Travel in a straight line, away right from there, just travel. Is there some point where there's nothing? Did, do you ever reach that point where there's nothing? You look out there and there, there's nothing else there. And if there is nothing there, then, you know, is nothing something. I, <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of mind boggling. It is mind boggling. Some point that you would just pass everything and nothing yeah. else. There. It's, almost, it's yeah. almost like there's, in, in our mind, there's got to be something that where it stops. I don't know. Right. Like the edge of the universe somewhere. Or the edge of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's just the way that. Well, I mean, some of those stars are so far out there, I don't think you can. That's kind of other out than Pluto, so. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of like trying to understand how God can never exist forever. Yes. 
never had a beginning. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's an awesome thing. And that's why, uh, again, Psalm 19, when I go back to that, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show with his handiwork. It had to be a God to put all this uh, into so, so vast, you know. Yes. Like yes. That Webb's telescope they got up there, yeah, they keep saying that they're discovering more and more universes all the time. Right? So I don't know how accurate they are. But recently, they said they discovered eight more okay. universes, you know. Yeah, interesting, interesting. All right, a couple things about comets, and we'll leave this discussion. Comets sometimes have temperatures of 300 to 400 degrees below zero. It's pretty cold. Comets contain elements unknown or very rare to us. Comets defy evolutionary models and predictions, as we said. Comets are destroyed by being burned up by the sun, or by smashing into the sun or a planet, or by being thrown out of the solar system completely. A comet traveling too fast will break apart. The inverse square law increases attraction as it gets closer to an object. And basically, that's just saying as something gets closer, the gravity grows stronger as it uh, gets closer. Comets are temporary. They cannot last millions of years. The Oort cloud has never been seen and can't be seen. It is accepted by faith. And again, to make that point, people will belittle us because we believe things by faith. Evolutionists believe a lot of things by faith too. So if they're going to be fair about it, they believe a lot of things by faith as well. Some believe a comet might have been a trigger for the flood. I mentioned this to y'all a while back. Uh, got Kent Hovine, I heard he's got some real good stuff on some of this, but he has a theory that an ice comet hit the earth and uh, caused, might have caused the flood. That may or may not be the case, but it was an interesting theory. An ice meteor traveling very fast would have broken up as it neared the planets, the earth, and the moon. It could have caused an increase in pressure, which would have caused the fountains of the deep to break up. Ice particles would have been deflected toward the poles because of magnetic fields. Super cold air is magnetized. A comet could have caused the Earth to wobble. Again, that may or may not be the case. There's no way to prove that, but an interesting theory uh, there. Uh, this is a quote from, I mentioned Carl Sagan. This is a quote from him. He's supposed to be like the leading evolutionist in the world. Uh, him and uh, Dawkins are two of the, but here's what he said. Many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution. Yet there is not there, yet there is not yet a shred of direct observational, 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 if I can say it, evidence for its existence. And again, that's a quote from Carl Sagan. So he said, this oil cloud they have to have for comets to exist is that we don't have a shred of evidence for it. So I, I commend him for at least admitting that. A guy named David Faulkner, a PhD in astronomy, uh, wrote, since it cannot be detected, the Oort cloud is not a scientific concept. This is not bad science, but non-science masquerading as science. The existence of comets is good evidence that the solar system is only a few thousand years old. And I agree. I think he's exactly right about that. Okay. Mention, um, again, earth wobbling. We talked about... Um, Something in our flood discussion about what was called the Chandler wobble, and I, I ran across this. I'm going to share this with you too. The Earth is thought to have had different tilts at, at different times. We talked about the Chandler wobble earlier. Uh, George Dodwell was the main astronomer of Australia from 1909 to the 1950s, and he made a graph of the tilt of the Earth. He thought something struck the Earth 4,350 years ago, and I tried to find this online, and I couldn't find it. Uh, there was another chart I was looking for just yesterday that I could not find, and it, it, I was looking for something to show you how they protect their theory. I was looking for a chart I had seen showing the gaps in the evolutionary uh, timeline, the, the branches of our ancestors, our animal ancestors, that I'd seen in a PowerPoint, in a presentation that was really, uh, really good. So I typed it in, couldn't find it. The only charts I could find were ones that had it completely formed and all the, so they, they protect their theory. So make no mistake about it. So if you're looking for something from, of a biblical nature, uh, and you just type it on the internet search engines, they will try to hide that evidence from you. And it's, that's unfortunate. Now, again, I found this online, and uh, it's about a 41,000-year cycle, and I put here, I'm not sure that I believe in this, but this could indicate it. this has been hit by something at some point. Earth's axial tilt 
of a perpendicular in its orientation to the sun, this tilt varies from 22.1 degrees to 21.5 degrees on a 41,000 year cycle. Again, I don't know that I, I, I don't agree with that. The current tilt is 23.3 and is decreasing. Ice age ice ages happen at maximum tilt. So people talk about global warming and this sort of thing, if this is true, and I don't know that it is, so I'll be quick to say, this is just one idea. But if our tilt is changing, that would, people say that the Earth's getting warmer, that would account for the Earth getting warmer if that's the case. Don't know that it is. So is that why the Earth has been colder? There was a, we're talking about the ice age of Noah's day. I read uh, in uh, uh, history books, I've seen there was another ice, a mini ice age around the 1300s uh, AD, where the temperatures were colder around the world and this sort of thing. So I don't know if the tilt has something to do with that or not, but just throwing it out there. Could this indicate that we were hit by a comet at the time of the flood? I don't know. Okay, any uh, questions or comments about any of that before we uh, move on? I think the bell's going to hit you soon. Just... We're good. He would know. He would know. Yes. I hadn't, I hadn't looked it up the previous yet, Coach, but I saw just looking through something the other day online that said, man, this sure does prove global warming wrong when it says, oh, here's Plymouth Rock that was stamped in 1620 when they landed. Is it sea level? It's still at sea level. Yeah. How sea level rising if this rock is still at sea level, guys? It, was, it should be underwater by now. That's true. But it's that's still true. there. That's a good point. Good well, point. Well, I'm going to knock you down. <laughs> 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 All right. I said the bells will catch us in a minute. But the next part of this, we're going to look at uh, the sun. I'll share a few things with you about the sun that, that uh, maybe you'll find interesting, some of the uh, facts about that and get into each of the planets, the various, the nine planets that we have, and we'll get into the Earth, Moon, uh, some of the facts about that uh, as well. So 50 times larger than Earth or more? I believe, I think I read it's a um, hundred times bigger than the Earth. I think it's, it's 10 times, so Jupiter is like 10 times the Earth, and then the Sun is 10 times Jupiter as far as the size. So I think it's about a hundred times our size. All right, well, I'm going to close with that uh, for, the, uh, for today. Good stopping point. Uh, thank you for your good attention and good comments. I'll pick up with that next time.